Okay, a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the whole presentation that I held this morning in uh, the Central Bank is a little bit longer, and I think you will receive the long one, but I only have 15 minutes, so I have to shorten it up a bit. So I will jump somehow to some pages, but nevertheless, if there are really some questions, may, we are small enough from the grid so that it, you may interrupt me. And, right. very much. Um, I'm working for the German Buffin, uh, means Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht, don't try to remember that. Um, we are the financial supervisor for Germany, for uh, banks, financial services, payment services, and insurances and investment services. We are not the central bank, as you probably know, it was formed the German Bundesbank, uh, which has now lost more or less all of its monetary powers to the European Central Bank, which is uh, the central bank for the Euro region. So, um, what is uh, essential to understand regulation about virtual currencies is that there is a regulation for every bank, for every financial services and payment providers to be licensed, as it is for insurances and all the others. So, uh, before they are allowed to start business in Germany, uh, they have to have a license granted by Buffin, and as soon as they have received the license, they are supervised in an ongoing process um, during their activity at the market. Um, the reason for supervision, and we have someone from the central bank here, I think it's quite clear, uh, we have a solvency aspect on the one side to, to grant uh, that uh, funds uh, have been um, given to the, uh, to the banks or to the financial services are somehow guaranteed to, to be treated according to existing, existing laws. And on the other hand, we have a kind of uh, market behavior that there are certain rules uh, what to do and what not to do uh, in, in their business practice, and so these two key elements, uh, market behavior and uh, solvency, uh, lead to um, the point of supervision um, for uh, all these companies. So in cases that there are companies who, um, yeah, let's say, don't want to be licensed because uh, licensing is quite uh, it's a longer process, and it's an expensive one because there's a lot of reporting and there's a lot of uh, uh, inspections probably and uh, so some uh, may attract the market by means of being unlicensed and in these cases of course we do need investigative powers to detect the unlicensed activities uh, and we need intervention powers uh, that we can take these illegal or unlicensed businesses off the markets. Uh, and there are some uh, yeah, general rules that we can do. We can ask for information and documents of these uh, illegal activities. We can have inspections on the premises of uh, illegal activities. We can do searches um, in the um, premises uh, and we can confiscate and safe key probably possible means of evidence like data or paperwork or apps. Um, and if we have detected illegal activities by our investigations, we can lift cease and desist orders related to that um, non-licensed activities on the market. We can order the uh, institution to reverse all transactions. Um, and we, if we assume uh, that the company is not able or at least not willing to rewind its unlicensed businesses, we can appoint uh, suitable persons uh, as liquidators and we uh, publish the cease and desist orders or the, and the appointment of liquidators uh, to the public on our website. Um, that was just a very, very short overview of what we do uh, uh, regarding the financial supervision. And um, now let me give a couple of words to uh, the regulation of virtual currencies. It started in 2010 when we get the first requests, what about this Bitcoin, is it, is it legal, is it suitable, is it, is it serious? And we have to, to draw a decision from the, from the supervisory point of view, um, how we handle the Bitcoins. And for that purpose, the first thing what we did 10 years ago was just 
to, to have a look on what, what is Bitcoin. So it's, at least it's not more than data, because there is no physical Bitcoin. We have a, a network uh, within the internet. Um, we have a data at certain addresses of how much or how many Bitcoin somebody owns. And if he doesn't own any Bitcoins, he can't transfer any Bitcoins. Um, it's a semi-anonymous thing, so that you can not guess from the visibility of the Bitcoin network uh, at which address which person belongs to. Uh, but for instance, if you want to have, if you want to receive Bitcoin payments, uh, you have to give an address to the public uh, to send the Bitcoins to. Uh, and at this certain point of stage, it becomes obvious that address A, B, 7, whatever, uh, belongs to a certain company. So it's a kind of semi-anonymous thing, but it's not totally anonymous. And what is very essential is that decentralized uh, virtual currencies have no administrative unit. So there is no Bitcoin company administrating or regulating the Bitcoin network, but it's, a, let's say, the bunch of all the people being part of this network uh, who belong to it, but you have no central administrative uh, unit or purpose or entity in the middle. And that made us, a th well, that gives us the, the opportunity and the problem to think of in our existing catalog of uh, licensing activities, what is Bitcoin and what are virtual currencies? And the first thing that we have thought of was a kind of uh, electronic money. Electronic money issuing is regulated by European directives and it's uh, transformed into national German law according to the European directive. And it means electronically stored monetary value, but that will do with bitcoins, which is accepted by natural or legal persons other than the issuer. First question, there is no issuer of bitcoins, but nevertheless it's accepted uh, as a means of payment, at least at the early stages of the bitcoin. For the purpose of making payment transaction, yes. Um, but it must be represented by a claim on the issuer, and the issuer has received funds. So, when you get bitcoins, where do you get them from? You get them from somebody who has already bitcoins and he sells it to you. But there is no issuing agency, no issuing company, who just creates bitcoins and sells them to the public. So, unfortunately, Bitcoins couldn't be regarded as electronic money from our point of view. Uh, because as you see in the diagram here, electronic money can be shared between third parties, but it's, it's all uh, referred to the issuing central administrative unit or central administrative company, and we don't have that in the Bitcoin or in the other networks. So, we have to find something else to, uh, to, to have a regulation on that. And uh, there is a nomenclatura of so-called financial instruments in the German and in the European law. Uh, and one of the things is foreign exchange or units of account. Because all the other things are more or less belonging to contractual agreements between parties. But foreign exchange or unit of account um, refer more to a kind of uh, yeah, central payment issue. So, bitcoins are no legal tender in any country, so they are no foreign exchange. Uh, but there is another, as I said, uh, thing that is, that is related to this point, um, for exchange or units of accounts. And units of accounts have been defined as things that are more or less comparable to currencies, but are not legal tender. And we have um, dealt with that in the past in the pre-Euro times. So when the um, Euro member states implemented the Euro, um, they tried to get uh, the, the private sector and also the, the commercial sector get, getting used to this Euro thing. Because in former times we had the French franc, we had the German mark, and nobody really has an idea what, what about the Euro. 
So what they did is they invented, implemented the EQ, which was a currency basket, an artificial currency basket, and there have never been printed bills in EQ. But when you have your uh, your account sheet, it said 10,000 German marks in brackets equivalent to 4,900 whatever EQ. It was the pre-stage of the euro. So the EQ was not a foreign exchange because it was not legal tender in any country, but it was just an artificial basket, and so it was a unit of account uh, because bills could be made in EQ or could be uh, shown in EQ. Another example for this are the, the special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund when they have uh, debts for certain countries and they would denominate the debt in just one currency. So stronger changes at the forex market, let's say for instance with the US dollar, uh, could lead to a decrease or the increase of, uh, of the debt amount in total. And to avoid this and put it on a more stable basis, they have a, uh, an artificial basket made of the leading um, currencies like Euro, uh, I think Yen, uh, British Pound, uh, US Dollar, and Swiss Franc. I'm not sure about that. And so, also these special drawing rights are now legal tender, but they are a means of, of calculating debts, um, and they are regarded as units of account. And what we had in Germany was um, a kind of a tendency in mountainous and rural areas uh, to have their own barter trade system to get probably out of control of tax uh, departments and other things. So they build up their own kind of local currency, which necessarily not have been printed on bills, uh, but it worked as a, as a means of, of, of exchange for the people living in that area. And also these things have been regarded as units of account. And we, we did the same with the Bitcoin, because Probably right now it's not longer suitable to use bitcoins as a means of payment. Uh, in, in the beginning it was, um, and so we summarized uh, bitcoins as units of account, and so they are financial instruments, and so that means everybody dealing with financial instruments on a commercial basis does require a license. Uh, to give you probably just a couple of examples, what you don't have to do, or when you don't um, um, require a license is, of course, if you just receive payments with Bitcoins or make payments with Bitcoins. Um, when there is a, a, a shop at the airport in Frankfurt and they take uh, US dollars as means of payments, they are no forex exchange. And so the, let's say, the bookstore who takes Bitcoins as a payment for a book um, is not a commercial trader of Bitcoins. And so, of course, the bookstore doesn't uh, require a financial license. But as soon as virtual currencies are more or less the object of trade, so you change fiat against virtual currency or vice versa, or you, you implement uh, virtual currency ADMs uh, in shop or in the store, or if you have accounts in virtual currencies, um, then it is a commercial uh, trade, it's a commercial dealing uh, the virtual currencies, and as they are financial instruments, that does require a license like shares do or like derivatives do. So that means there is no leaks Bitcoin in Germany, but uh, you require a license for that, and every bank or financial service that has a license is allowed to deal in contracts or in exchanges with Bitcoins. So I have to skip some of these things here. Why do we do that? Um, I have explained that the two main focus issues on supervision are um, market behavior and insolvency. And the risks that are related with, with the budget currencies are probably not new, but they are newly combined in one issue. So you can have a physical loss of bitcoins by means if you quit, uh, if you just lose your private key. Uh, then you, you can wake up every morning, look at your bitcoin address, say, okay, well, fine, I have 100 bitcoins. But you're not, allowed, you're not able to transfer them without your private key. So they will be on that address until eternity, but you can't move them anymore, and so you can't sell them. 
Um, of course, we have a quite high volatility uh, in, in, um, in the Bitcoin and in other um, virtual currencies. You have the problem of, uh, that is discussed, of network takeovers. You have the problems of hacker attacks. Um, and, of course, you have the problem of um, tax evasion and money laundering, and the use of um, virtual currencies for illegal businesses. Um, there was a discussion whether virtual currencies have an impact on, yeah, on, on, on fiscal politics and on public finance. Um, from, from, or from, from the point right now, they don't, because the, uh, even if Bitcoin is, is uh, the highest capitalized virtual currency of the market, the, uh, the amount of worldwide trade in virtual currencies that are not just faked trades to probably lift or lower the prices um, are really not important in comparison with the normal business that takes place. But still, some consider um, virtual currencies as a kind of challenge for public finance, uh, especially if we're talking about non-decentralized virtual currencies that are issued by a global player, for instance, like Facebook, uh, in connection with the word Libra. And you have still existing um, international disparities in the regulation of Bitcoin. So we are on a quite uh, conservative, uh, strict approach to these, uh, to these virtual currencies. There are other countries in Europe that consider the exchange of Bitcoin more or less as a kind of commercial issues like selling books or selling beer. Um, and uh, this allows, of course, uh, companies to, to settle down there, get a commercial register as a, as a beer vendor, and then start to trade with Bitcoins uh, and not being obliged to AML or KYC or other rules. Um, our main focus in the supervision of, um, of virtual currencies uh, is the connection between the fiat money circle and virtual currencies. Because uh, right now you aren't able to buy real estate with Bitcoin, you aren't able to buy Lamborghinis with Bitcoins, and uh, in most of the cases you won't even get expensive watches with Bitcoins. But nevertheless, they allow uh, the exchange of funds between certain third parties, which have to, if they want to take part in, 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 the, in the fiat circle of money, um, they have to use some exchanges at, at, at a certain moment. And these are for us the, the key issues uh, and the, the key points for supervision uh, to, to implement rules on, on anti-money laundering and know your customer principles. Um, to give uh, a certain security to the financial system, uh, which could probably get to serious damage if you if you don't allow KYC and AML rules to apply um, at that certain point. So I think my 15 minutes are nearly passed by. So are there any questions? Oh yes. Not. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, number one, when you said you are not allowed to buy land, what if I'm selling the land for Bitcoins? Is there a ban on selling? No, there is no ban on that. But what you can do um, is um, you can have a contract that is uh, related to euros. And if you buy land or real estate, uh, there are taxes on that. Uh, it has to be a notary confirmation, which is, which is uh, linked to the amount that is yeah. paid for that. And uh, the, the exchange itself can be made in Bitcoin, but there is another problem for you because the notary has to um, certify that the amount is paid. Uh, and he wouldn't do that on a blockchain transaction. So I think in, in practice it wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it? Because he has to certify that the amount in euro is paid from the from the seller uh, is paid from the buyer to the to the seller and he could certify that by a kind of a bank statement or whatever but he can't do that with a blockchain transaction because uh, 
to be sure that the blockchain transaction, which is at the moment only address A to address B, uh, and the connection of the persons to address A to address B, uh, is not visible by the blockchain. So for him, it is a problem to certify the payment between these two parties. Because they, of course, they can tell, but they can tell him, well, I'm address A, he's address B, and they probably can even show their private keys, uh, but he couldn't check that out. And so, probably it will be allowed in the future if, they, if there is a change to certain real estate uh, regulations regarding the, the, the setting uh, of them. But from the legal perspective right now, the notary wouldn't satisfy that. I can understand the law of the land, but you could also do more by expensive watches. Uh, from from uh, most of the, of course you can. You can do that somewhere, probably on a private basis. But um, the, um, the official vendors of the luxury price product like jewelry, watches, etc. Uh, they are under AML regulations in Germany, yes. like financial institutions. Uh, and they do have to report on uh, KYC issues. Uh, and they wouldn't accept Bitcoin because they, they can't obey the, the, the belonging AML and KYC issues. Well, if I'm proving that, I mean, I'm going to the notary and I'm telling who I am and know your customer is who I am. Know your customer is not only knowing who he is, but uh, know your customer is also knowing the background of the transaction. But uh, to be honest, you're, in somehow you're, you're right, because if the payment is made in cash, none of these vendors would, would disagree to sell it. But uh, in this case, he has the cash, and he will put it to the account, to his account. Um, probably he will take tax on that, uh, but he wouldn't accept it. Uh, so the second question I have is more fundamental. The definition between assets and money you brought, uh, which was in the basis of the EU regulation and also the law, was about central issuing authority. I imagine it's not the Bitcoin, it's a Ethereum, or it's the Libra, and it's issued by Facebook. If Facebook were to issue, would it become a uh, uh, currency by definition? Because there is a central issuing company, and... Yep. Yeah. So we are... Um it's, uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to talk about the Libra case because some of these issues are classified. But we can talk about this in general. If there is a... Yeah, the, the question is not only to, to stick it to, to one of these, but it has to, has to fit to every structure that you have regarding virtual currency. So if I have a central issuing or selling institution, um, we would regard that generally as money, but there are a few obstacles. There is one lack in the European um, regulation that said e-money is only if you sell it for fiat. So if you sell your payment token, however you may call it, against virtual currencies, it's not e-money. That's the first obstacle. But if we uh, if we tend to the um, to the uh, elect, uh, to the payment by fiat, generally, yes, it is e-money. The question is, who is the issuer? So if we talking probably about the situation that there is an association or a kind of structure, and if you just imagine that they may have certain selling points, who sell these? tokens. Then the question is who is the issuer and who is the e-money institution? So if we're talking about stable coins, it may be the case that there is a kind of fund system behind that, which is not under control of the point of sale. 
Um, but the fund structure doesn't sell the token. And so there are still some discussions uh, in this case because uh, to, to find uh, a legal opinion on that, this is an, it is necessary to know the contract regulation, uh, the contract terms and conditions uh, between this fund structure and the point of sale. And if you don't know them, uh, you really couldn't say who is the issuer of e-money in this case. But in general, it would be e-money as long as there is a central institution who is responsible for that. Technically, yeah. would deter a company like Facebook or Google to issue currency that is distributed ledger, but kind of meets all the requirements you were imagine that for sake of experiment I'm going to offer this virtual currency and some people are going to buy it. Yeah. And all your KYC and all your AML uh, requirements are met. Yeah. What is what you are going to do? Uh, this is a political question because um, there's there's a lot of discussion between and we are not a central bank, just to keep that in mind. So if we have a construction where we could clearly say, okay, this is e-money issued by, let's say, the point of sale or the construction behind it, doesn't matter at all. Then the question is, is the regulation of e-money issuers, which is far behind the regulation of banks, uh, enough to handle a global worldwide virtual currency which is probably accepted on the on the fact that the potential acceptance are not attracted only by the virtual currency but are used to the system by buying other things there or by being on a social media platform this is a political uh, decision to draw regulations to either forbid that or find probably a new regulation on that, or to say, well, we don't care. From the, from the legal, from the actual legal uh, situation, um, this is not more than whether you regard that as suitable, this is a kind of a political decision. And there's a lot of uh, discussion, of course, when going in Europe and with the US, uh, because as far as it was in the media, so there have been a lot of statements on that. Uh, statements on that. Uh, many of uh, the supervisors and uh, the rest of the national central banks in the euro section and also the central banks in the non-euro section of the European Union uh, consider it not to be a suitable regulation of uh, such a worldwide um, system by just regulating it as a, as an e-money issuer, but we'll see what's going on. Because my last question, maybe also add more. If uh, you are looking from regulator perspective as an asset, do you look at the risky and as an institution, do you that are risky and are you? Uh, saying all the qualified individuals can do it or uh, everybody can do with it. Because mm -hmm. imagine tomorrow we have quantum computing. And quantum computing is not only for programming years, but it can be taught to reformulate the blockchain uh, 20 years ago in a very short period of time. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, do you I'm not saying it's there, but it's very likely that in five years it's going to be in place. So in that case, everything that is based on distributed ledger is going to be as risky as non-distributed ledger. Yep. So did you ever discuss the possibility of saying, okay, this is something that is maybe quite dangerous, and you would rather refrain from it unless you are a perfect individual, uh, yeah, we had that discussion, uh, and probably even if we don't believe in 
quantum computers in the near future. Uh, nevertheless, on the on the um, on the on the total quality of risks that that are involved with the uh, with the storage, with the transaction of virtual currencies, especially some issues about the Bitcoin and what will be what will happen uh, if the 21 millionth Bitcoin is created and there will be no more new Bitcoins within the system, all these scenarios. Um, there is quite a lot of risk, but there is no approach from right now to see it as a high-risk instrument uh, that should be at least forbidden or banned for retailers and only left for, um, for professional engagement. Uh, we have a couple of uh, things that have been forbidden for the retail market, like CFDs with uh, uh, additional payment obligations. Um, but with the virtual currencies, uh, we don't think that that does make sense at all. Um, because, to be honest, the, the possibility what can happen is uh, that you lose your money. Um, and that is considerably the only problem, which might be a big one for for for, for the one who's solely invested in Bitcoin. But uh, that is the same um, problem that if you solely have been invested in certificates of Lehman Brothers, uh, you face more or less the same challenge from, from your personal point of view. Um, systemically, um, we don't think that this thing is a, is a, a high risk. Uh, product that should be uh, that should be uh, kept from the retail market now. Uh, sure. um, yeah, we'll yeah, I'll take this uh, one. Yeah. So I will stand maybe in front of you. Um, so my name is Bahagan. I am a founder of a fintech startup. We do currency exchange, but it's not uh, it's not uh, Bitcoin. It's fiat currency, and um, and we do the, our business in Europe. Um, my question is: um, two or three years ago, when I was in Latvia. Um, one of the one of uh, colleagues of mine was fired because of trade. Uh, he was in Nordea Bank he, because of trade of uh, Bitcoin, and because he received he exchanged Bitcoin and received fiat money in his bank account. And he was fired from Nordea right away, right after that event, um, and uh, two or three years ago from like financial community uh, standpoint, it was very risky to do anything connected to the Bitcoin, to the blockchain. Um, there was a lot of buzz around it. It was very risky. Now, every day I see new and new application, new businesses uh, that are built uh, on Bitcoin or blockchain technology. Um, and uh, it seems to me that with uh, introduction of this initiative of um, regulating the exchange uh, offices, I would say. Uh, the problems connected to the Bitcoin or other um, currencies uh, would go away, but the fear of building, investing into the Bitcoin or building something connected to the uh, Bitcoin is still there. Why so? Why uh, uh, the change is happening um, so slowly? Slowly, If there is somehow the government or the central bank came with a solution to exchange the um, exchange uh, offices. Um, okay, there, there were, there were um, a couple of uh, 
interesting arguments. Uh, the first one was, right, yes, there was a kind of hysteria uh, related to, to Bitcoins in the beginning, especially, uh, to give you an example, we received uh, uh, STRs, so that means suspicious transaction reports from, from banks and financial institutions. In every case, when there was just Bitcoin uh, in, the, in, in the account details, that was a guy who bought his first Bitcoin. There is no reason for an STR in this case, but nevertheless, every bank was, well, Bitcoin good. Well. Um, that is gone. Uh, and regarding that trade in Nordea, probably that was not only a Bitcoin problem, probably that was a problem uh, of violating internal rules because some of uh, the traders are not allowed to place private trades. And if they are allowed, they're probably not allowed to, to do that on Nordea accounts. So I, I don't know that case, uh, but there might be other reasons for that. Because, um, as I said, every bank or every financial service in Germany is allowed to handle Bitcoin. But there are recently only two doing that. Uh, so every Sparkasse, which is a kind of a local uh, a bank structure, can have a Bitcoin uh, ADM in their, in their premises, but nobody does. Um, and probably you you may ask the banks why they don't do that. Uh, probably they, they have their own imagination about uh, uh, winnings, earnings and risks and say, okay, this is, this is a very small part of the market. We don't expect many earnings on that and we expect a quite high risk structure uh, for KYC purposes and also just in case if something's happened and we are the first bank where there is a terrorism fi financing thing with Bitcoins, oh my God, uh, well, we won't do that. Um, so that was about that. And regarding the regulation of the, um, um, of the exchanges, uh, there is a change in the Euro European um, legislation with the forthcoming fifth money um, uh, laundering directive. Uh, that forces every jurisdiction in Europe to put uh, virtual currency exchanges and so-called wallet custodians, that means um, entities that keep your bitcoins for you or your whatever virtual currency. Uh, they are uh, by force um, uh, regulated by the AML rules of each country. But that doesn't mean that they are financial services or banks. There are two possibilities. To, uh, to met with a fifth AML directive. I could put these wallet custodians and exchange trades under AML rules, that's opportunity one. Or I can put it them under the, under the financial uh, supervision rules, because everybody who's under financial supervision rules is under AML rule, so that goes with it. Um, we have been in discussion with quite a lot of European supervisors over the, all the years, and they said, well, we are thinking uh, and we don't have uh, we don't have that issue in our country, which was very funny because I received that response from one of the Baltic states. I wouldn't say which one, but it was one of the Baltic states. And believe me, they have bitcoins there. Uh, but they, for for whatever reason, uh, they really don't want or they don't think it's suitable to, to put it in a kind of certain regulation thing. And everybody said, well, we're waiting for a. Uh, we're waiting for a um, European guideline. Uh, and there were attempts to put uh, the, the virtual currency issue in the payment service directive, which I believe is wrong because, as we said, in the uh, case of e-money issuing and the case of issuing a payment token or other probably utility and security token, um, then it does make sense because I have a certain administrative unit. But if you're talking about either um, or, um, or Bitcoin, it doesn't make sense because I have no Bitcoin company to, to be subject to a payment service directive rule. So nevertheless, that would, probably they waited for, for another directive, whatever, and it doesn't happen. So first step is the AML rule right now. And if there's, they, I think they will see uh, whether this is a hype which is probably more in the media than in the real market. Um, and they will regard the application of the fifth AML in the, in the member states in the next years. And if it works, probably that's it. And if it doesn't work, probably 
we see a new regulation to apply in the norm. Okay. Any other questions? Please. Can we consider that the using of the blockchain technology for the payment is a matter of time? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure because we, when we're talking about blockchain, so what is blockchain? Blockchain is a decentral instrument so that probably everybody can read and write and everybody agrees that, that what is perpetrated on the blockchain is true and the only truth. So. If I have a company that says, well, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving token to the public, uh, and I have my blockchain here, well, I'm, I'm write only and I'm read only. Is that a blockchain? No, it isn't. It's a database. So if we're talking about real blockchains, real decentral blockchains, or permissive blockchains that at least combine uh, uh, the, the, the partnership of several players on the financial market. Yes, of course, there are a couple of use cases where interbanking trade and interbanking accounting uh, has been tested on blockchains. Because in these cases we have, let's say, five players, we have a kind of certain exchange between them, uh, and they agree on having that on the blockchain. That doesn't make sense, but that wouldn't affect the public. So if we're talking about public payments in retail payments, small amount of payments, probably microcredit issues. Uh, I don't think that we will have uh, very soon a, a blockchain-based issue because um, the, the sense behind that, well, I, I didn't see the sense behind that because if we're talking about this payment, there are so many players. Uh, we have the, 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 the financial service provider of one client, the other client, and they all have to agree on the same standard. Uh, and there have been several attempts to have uh, to match common standards in international payment structures, and uh, they failed ever since. So I'm not quite I'm quite pessimistic about that. But well, in general, we are techno technology from the point of technology, we are neutral. So blockchain is not a subject of license. So you can imagine blockchain in combination with uh, real estate uh, registrations where, where courts and public notaries um, have their rights and everybody could look into a blockchain, okay, this house belongs to me. But blockchain also means public and uh, public visibility. So the question is, data protection and all these other things, do you want to have at a certain level uh, your payment structures to be visible on a public blockchain. And I know quite a lot of people say, no, I don't want that. So these are the, the key issues in, um, in talking about payments uh, on blockchain structures. Uh, more questions. So the China is mining uh, cryptocurrencies very much. I mean, uh, what do you think why they are doing that? Because uh, almost 70% of the mining business is going, uh, mining process goes on in China. Uh, what you can say about it? Okay, but yeah, that is uh, that's his issue. So that is a, about mining. Um, just a short sentence to that. Nobody is really sure about the percentage rates. There are some other players uh, in that game, um, but the key issue is cheap electricity, uh, and uh, at least more or less probably no taxes. And then you will get the next presentation about that. Thank you.
But it's readable. Yeah, it's readable. Yeah, it's readable. It's readable. It's readable. PDF format. This is PDF here. Cryptocurrencies as a sort of asset where people can invest some money and how to protect them. So it's a financial regulation. Yeah. So this is the main discussion. But of course, cryptocurrencies, especially bitcoins, they have to be produced. Yeah. This is a process, and you need for that electricity, quite a lot of electricity. You need computers. Uh, you need a building or something. So you, you need economic resources to create this, to mine the currencies. And that's what uh, what we will do here, what I did for Georgia last year, is to estimate the economic importance of the mining sector for the economy. So not for the financial sector, but for the real sector. Because Georgia is a very small country, and when it started, people were saying it was like third or fourth largest miner in the world. So there must be some economic importance. And when we ask the people in the central bank or in the ministries, how important is it? No idea. Nobody could even tell a number, nothing. Yeah? And then we said, okay, let's look at the issue because everyone is talking about it. And if everyone talks about something, it's nice to put some numbers to this. And uh, what we did first is to look at statistics, of course, to see if there are some statistics in which there is a position, crypto mining, but of course there is no such a position. Uh, and we find out that crypto mining is part of real estate, renting, and business activities. So and the idea was to look at this position and see if there is major changes, and from the changes you could say, oh, what happened there? But if you see here, not major change, and this is the change in percentage, which is more or less similar to GDP, so nothing happened here. So what we came clear here is that the public statistics are not really capturing this sector either at all or if a very little amount of it. And that's why we decided to do our own estimation. So not just to look it up in the statistics, but to do our own estimation. And an own estimation is, of course, a lot of work because you have to think about the method, how to get to that. And we decided that the best method is to go through electricity. Why? Because there is a strong link to electricity needed. So to calculate what is the consumption of electricity of miners, from that to see how many bitcoins were mined, and from that how much turnover was that, so that's the idea of our estimation. And uh, so we started with a, um, calculating the um, facilities, and we got to a number 65 megawatt installed capacity. 
again, this was not just something we read somewhere. We read a lot of articles with lots of different numbers from different uh, companies. We had lots of interviews, and this is the number we got at the end, which we think is most reliable. And uh, also to students here, I think it's also important not just to look at literature, but to talk to market participants, because if we had just looked at literature, the number would be maybe not correct. So this is a number of taking into consideration reports, talking to experts and different people. And if you assume that this capacity is running all day and all night, 24 hours, 365 days a year, you get to 600, 570,000 megawatts hour per year of electricity they need. This is something we calculate. This is 6% of total uh, electricity consumption in Georgia in 2017. It's quite a lot, 6%. But then we had also a possibility check because ESCO is an institution uh, in Georgia. They collect the direct contracts with the miners. That was new when we started doing this. They did it for two months. And from these two months, we were able to say how much is the year. And then we get to a very similar number, 676,000 megawatt hour. So we had the feeling we are more or less on the right track. Maybe we are 5% too high, 5% too low, but it's not about the position after the point. It is about just getting a feeling of how important it is. So that's uh, our estimation of electricity consumption, and I think it was uh, quite a reliable one. You actually attribute all the increasing electricity consumption to return or to mining? No, we, we tried that way also before and it didn't work. It's very difficult. Uh, the, our first approach was to look at the change in, in, in electricity consumption and from that derive this. But this is really difficult. What we did is, well, first from the installed capacity, that's uh, the one one, and the other is this ESCO. ESCO is the... I understand this before. Yeah, and so we didn't look at, we look at uh, electricity demand but uh, we didn't, we try to do it from that, it's much more difficult because you have weather, you have uh, s specific factors, uh, so it's very difficult from the electricity consumption to get to a number about the part of the increase which is really only because of the um, miners. We did a parallel something on that, but uh, I think this method is much more reliable than the one over the electricity demand. So, now, this is the calculation we did. This is how much electricity is needed for one Bitcoin. And you divide the amount of consumption through what you need per Bitcoin, and so you get to 67,000 Bitcoins per year. And then also the actual transaction fees, yeah? If once you uh, recognize some transaction, you get additional coins, and we get to a total of about 77,000 Bitcoins a year. And, of course, we're doing here with average prices. It's impossible to know exactly at which price these bitcoins were sold, if they were sold at all, maybe they are still there, maybe they were sold, maybe they were sold much more expensive, maybe they, no idea. But we took just the average for 2017, which was $4,000, and so we get to a turnover of $311 million. And I think having the turnover is already a, a huge step because you know what, what you roughly are talking about. Of course, this is not the economic importance, this is a turnover, but it already helps you a lot as a first step. And then, of course, you have to deduct the, if you want to get to the profits of the companies, you have to deduct the costs. And that's what we did here, cost of electricity. Unfortunately, there is no information on how much they pay for electricity. There might be good reasons for that, but... Uh, Again, interviews were important here because apparently they were paying very little. Okay, so we said five cents per kilo megawatt uh, 
uh, what was the price per kilowatt hours. Uh, that's our assumption without knowing for sure. And this makes it to $28 million per year of electricity. Then we have uh, the cost for labor. And that was really funny because uh, I thought, okay, an industry with a turnover of more than 300 million, uh, there must be some people who are working there. <laughs> but uh, the conclusion from interviews and so on was that about 300 people are working there. And this is not the fanciest engineers in IT, I mean, this is including security staff and bookkeepers and all that, yeah. 300 people, so it's nothing. Earning $3 million per year. So it's a highly capital energy intensive industry with almost no labor input for, for, for here. And of course, little impact on the labor market. Then we had uh, the processors because you have to, to buy processors. So we find out which are the processors which are bought, mostly from China, how long they can be used. And that time it was about two years. This might have changed now, but it was for 17. What do they cost and so on? And we got to a number of 72 million for one year. That's the cost of processors. And uh, the funny thing, of course, is that we look at import data. And if you see here, it's much less for the whole category of, of, of import of automatic data processing machines. So what is clear is that the 72 million are not here. Yeah? So there are some problems with the statistics uh, again. And um, so we get to the profits. Profits is a business, it's not an economic category, it's more of a business category. So we said 311 million turnover, electricity, labor costs, equipment, other costs like renting and so on. Uh, so we get to 138 million dollars profit, which is good money, I must say. In an industry with only 300 persons working, it's quite good money. But of course, we're not just interested in profits, but on economic importance. And for that, actually, what you need is uh, to uh, look at the turnover and deduct all the imports, because the imports are not contributors to GDP, the imports you have to deduct from turnover. And we deducted electricity processes, other inputs, the, the labor we kept, because labor is part of GDP, but not the computers, they are imported. And we get to a similar number, 181, which is 1.2% of GDP. So that's the number we were looking for, the economic importance of crypto mining in Georgia in the year 2017 was 1.2% of GDP. And of course, for many people say 1% doesn't look very big, but 1% of GDP is a, <laughs> it's quite a lot. And it's comparable with mining. So the whole mining industry, which is quite big, it's not as big as here maybe, but still very big in, in Georgia. And it's comparable to, to proper mining. It's comparable to manufacturing of alcoholic beverages. I mean, it is quite famous country for wine, Georgia, and this mining is almost the same number as whole alcoholic beverage. So it's a lot. Yeah, and that's uh, an important uh, conclusion. This is our first main conclusion. It's not, uh, I'm not talking about economic implications, I'm just saying first, just the analysis. And again, it's always important, I assume, many of your students, uh, at least my approach is first look at the facts and then start talking about this and not to make sure that a lot all the time. So, and now uh, one important issue is the taxation. And that was also quite interesting. What about profit tax? Now we will tell them in uh, free economic zones, they don't pay profit tax, okay. What about VAT input when you imp import the machines, the, 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 the computers? Now they don't pay because it's a free industrial zone. For electricity also not. No import tariffs. 
So the conclusion is they don't pay taxes. <laughs> they produce, they make good money, they earn 178 million in profits, but they don't pay taxes. That's quite interesting. Especially from a fiscal point of view. <laughs> so I can skip that. So I come to the um, recommendations because our job, we're not business consultants, we're uh, consulting uh, governments. So our clients are central banks, or Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, these are the typical clients who work for. So one thing is that it's clear crypto mining is strong, it's 1.2% of GDP. We think it would make sense to try to track it better in its official statistics in the case of Georgia. Uh, electricity market, of course, it's quite of a nightmare to have an industry consuming 6% um, because they can be gone tomorrow. If the price is very low, they will stop producing. <laughs> in electricity, you have to plan a little bit. You cannot just produce from today to tomorrow. And you have here an industry which can go up, can close. You don't know what happens, and, and this is quite uh, difficult to, to, to create a stability and bring together supply and demand. Of course, the hope of some people in the Ministry of Economy was that by having a crypto mining there, you could go to FBI events and say, look, we're a strong mining country here. That means we're a very open, uh, pro-IT economy, and you should come here and you would get IT engineers. But as far as I can judge, I'm not a specialist, but I talk to many people here, uh, the link between these miners and, and other parts of this IT economy is not that strong, or not at all that strong, actually. And this shows because there are some miners in Transnistria and Abkhazia, so the mine, this mining seems to be a bit isolated for the whole, from this start-up uh, environment. And taxation, no taxation. So that's the end of what I presented in Georgia, but I can talk a bit more open here. Uh, and for a country, of course, for the Ministry of Economy, what do you want? You want investment, yes, but you want investment that creates jobs. Does it create jobs? No. So uh, no much positive effects here. Then for the Ministry of Finance, you want business, but you want it to pay taxes. Do they pay taxes? No. Okay, so uh, they put some pressure on the electricity market. So at the end of the day, the question is, so what's, what's in for the country here? Okay, they're making good money, but uh, what should be our position for, on that? And, and I think the position should be, if they come to a country, they should first, of course, be a normal business. They should, I mean, why should they not pay taxes? They are making a fortune, yeah? 178 million profits. Why should they not pay taxes? There is no reason for that. They are using the country. They are using the resources. So they should pay taxes. Second, there should be proper prices for electricity. There is no reason why the cheap electricity in Georgia goes to the miners. And maybe the population has to pay a higher uh, tariff or other industries. I mean, I see no reason for that. Uh, so, and they don't create much jobs and they don't create, attract other business, so I don't see the Ministry of Economy should actively try to attract this investment. If someone wants to come to the country, yes, fine, do it, but it's your business, pay taxes, but we're not going to subsidize you or to support you because there is no reason for that. Yeah. So this is our, our conclusions, and I thought of some ideas, I mean, I don't know if you are interested in that, but maybe uh, you can think about, if we meet again, uh, how would you see uh, Armenia as a possible place for mining? Do you think it's a good place for mining? Do you think the right uh, parameters are given here? And also, we were told there is some mining going on in one free economic zone. Well, that's the case, yeah. Uh, we were told there's some... Also there, apparently, they're not paying uh, 
much for electricity or taxes. That was we were told. Why it is so, so we don't know. Uh, uh, so this would be actually a nice task for some team of students just to, to deal with this and do, do something similar like I did for Georgia and just to check what's going on here, why and, and how, how do you see that. That's just a suggestion. Okay, that's the presentation and if you have any questions, please let me know. Questions? Do I have a question? No. no. Uh, can you please uh, tell more about these 300 people? So only 300 people uh, um, like makes the process of this mining in Georgia, yes? Only what? Only 300 people uh, create this process of mining in Georgia. People employed in the industry. Like in the industry. Uh -huh. Do you consider the owners of miners as employees of the miners or not? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I mean, the owners is a different story. Uh, I think I can talk about this here. Uh, apparently, I mean, there's one big company, Bit Fury, and apparently, uh, the, let's say the big boss was behind that. So, uh, this uh, video was somehow the ultimate infrastructure, apparently. And this could explain also the very benign treatment of this company and the high profits and so on. That, that I cannot show you, as this is not for me, but uh, apparently that there is, uh, uh, this is the case, and, but this is not cooperative or something. This is not start up from, from people who are 25 and are, are garage and, and more uh, uh, renting business, uh, rent business and uh, innovative uh, IT business. Any more questions? Then it was so benign. Uh, but still, uh, it created not only profits for him, 300 people, highly paid jobs. Also, very large computing power. Yeah. It was also interesting that during this time, a lot of investments went into electricity generation. If you look, for example, the largest infrastructure problems, the programs they have, it was either roads or hydropower. So, together it makes quite a sense. Well, let me. Uh, did I try a question to digital currencies? Um, yes, sir. If I may. Um, to the, the discussions on uh, issuing the official digital currency, I mean among the central banks, were intensified after the, the Libra, the Facebook, announced about the issuance of, um, about the intention of issuing Libra. And as I know, the, uh, um, the group of uh, German banks, uh, commercial banks, like proposed to ECB to, uh, to be the one of the first uh, issuers of uh, the digital currency. And uh, what do you think in how, when it will be, uh, I mean, um, uh, come in effect? Like in two years or um, or is it uh, in the near future? The China Bank of China also is uh, like uh, working towards the the uh, and not only the Bank of China actually. Um, to be honest, uh, I don't know. Um, this is um, we're coming into effect, or if there are any signs when it probably is implemented. Uh, to be honest, the, there are different intentions behind that. So we are talking about the interbanking market on the one hand, and then we are talking about uh, also retail-based central money digital uh, issuance uh, like they have, for instance, prepared in, in Singapore. The, the MAS in Singapore, which is a central bank there and central supervisor, uh, has a working model for the issuance of the Singapore dollar in, uh, as, a, as a virtual currency. 
Uh, it is uh, it's ready made, but it's not in effect because I think they have some other political issues right now at the moment. So I don't know. Uh, I've been in Singapore and um, I have seen that, that project, which is quite interesting. Um, this is um, a political issue because um, the question, there are some questions. If you do it just for the interbanking trade, um, where it is right now, even it's widely spread, uh, if we're talking uh, talking about the target uh, target sheets and target accounts and all this stuff, where it's just uh, the, the euro is uh, just being pushed from one side to the other, and so in the interbanking section, you're not far away from the virtual currency because it's more or less all bookkeeping and not really payment. Um, if we're talking about the retail sector, there are quite a lot of uh, discussions and issues. Uh, because in Germany, and I only may speak for, for the German retail market here, um, consumers are not only happy about that idea. Because, as I said, uh, if you talk about uh, electronic payments, and that probably does only make sense if you, on a, on a long haul basis, think as a replacement of cash. Uh, that would mean that every money transaction uh, can be recorded and can be used by whomever uh, which is who is able to to get in contact with the data so that means uh, your invoice in the bar last night could probably be seen by somebody who is investigating that and that make, makes people afraid so Germany is one of the countries in, in Europe where the, the cash payment rate is one of the highest. It's, I think it's at a 50% level. So 50% are done by credit cards and, and debit cards and, and other means of electronic payment issues, but 50% are done in cash. Um, and I don't think that electronic virtual, not currency, but a virtual euro would be widely accepted. But even those people who use cash pay, uh, who use card payments right now, they use it, let's say, for instance, in uh, quite convenient and non-critical areas like paying uh, a train ticket or paying uh, uh, a plane ticket or, or uh, use it in a restaurant. But like if you're going with a couple of friends into a bar, probably you prefer to pay cash not to have that uh, that credit card receipt visible to your wife, just as an imagination. Uh, and so even those who accept uh, card payments still use cash payments in certain situations where they probably don't want even a receipt. Um, and that might be one of the issues where I then think uh, that um, the, uh, the people in Germany would accept uh, a virtual uh, Euro payment only. For investigators, it's a dream, you know, because every transaction is somehow visible and even if the law says, well, uh, you're not allowed to read that data, we probably may have a terrorist event or some other impacts on social structure that leads to a new law that said, okay, uh, well, in some cases you are allowed to. Uh, to give you an example, we have, for us, it's, it's a perfect system. Uh, we implemented an account demand database for the supervisors and police. It was, uh, I think it's 13, yeah, 13 years ago, something. Because in the, in the early stages of investigation, I have no central bank register. So, if I do investigate in any illegal activity, I have to guess where probably this guy may have an account. So where is he born? Where, he, where did he went to the university? Because this is the time when you probably have your first own accounts. Where does he live? Uh, where has he been seen lately? And then I may ask the banks in these areas to, uh, to tell me whether they have an account for Hans Meyer or not. So after some terrorists events, uh, they, uh, they implemented a German-wide database 
where every account anybody has has to be uh, put in this data. And as soon as I'm investigating in Hans Meyer on the 1st of January 1960, I just put it into that uh, request scheme and every licensed bank and financial institution is connected to the system. And I get the immediate result, okay, Hans Meyer born that has three accounts, one with the Postbank, one with the German bank, and one with the Sparkasse. And then, what I don't see at that certain point of stage is the account balance and the account history, I don't see it. But then I can address to three banks where I definitely know he has an account. Uh, and uh, ask the guys, okay, just show me the opening documents and show me the account balance sheets for, let's say, the last year. And I can investigate in his payments, what did he get and what did he pay. And that was originally implemented for the fighting of uh, terrorism. And it gets sliced by sliced, sliced by sliced by sliced, kind of salami. Um, it's getting widened more and more. So then it was serious crime, then it was organized crime, then it was serious fraud. And organized. <laughs> serious organized fraud crime. Uh, and right now it is even if you don't pay uh, your, the, um, the contributions to your child when you are divorced. Uh, and right now even for these reasons, uh, the banking data system could be questioned. So and that's what I mean if you're talking about this virtual currency euro thing and every payment is done. Of course, in the beginning it would be, okay, we can check the database with all banks only in case of terrorism. Uh, but probably 10 years later, it might be available for questions in connection with minor offenses. And this is one of the, uh, from data protection issues, one of the main uh, fear that consumers may have. And so I don't think that we get that soon. For the retail market. For interbanking? For interbanking, yeah, because what this is more or less a kind of the question of the technical implementation. Because blockchain is technology neutral. So if I have let's say if if I do it on paperwork or if I do it on, on a blockchain or if I do stone carving, but does at all if you if you take a look at the results, it doesn't make a big difference. So Euro 1 goes from there to there. And if it's done on the blockchain, yeah, they can. But what they have to do uh, is to, to implement uh, a, common, a common sense of the, the structure and the functions of that database. And if it should be done with the, uh, with the, with the European Central Bank, then we're talking about something else. Because if we done it as a kind of pilot project in one country, of course the thoughts are going for the way it's okay, we have, uh, we have 27 or 26, sorry, uh, other members in the European Union. And so, some of them are part in the Eurozone, some are not, but some are probably coming. So we think about a solution that is suitable for all of the countries. And then we're talking again in 40 years, because that wouldn't go that. I suppose. Imagine if everybody agrees to that. Do you believe that electricity costs would bear that wouldn't be too costly for central banks to run interbank market on Bitcoin because it will be extremely expensive? Um, well, I don't think that uh, central bank models for virtual currency uh, must be based on a proof of work thing. Like the, all these issues with the Bitcoin uh, thing uh, are related to that proof of work algorithm stuff which need a, a large amount of electricity. If we're talking about proof of stake um, procedures in verifying transactions, and if we're talking about uh, central bank money within the interbanking trade where the um, where well, probably the attempts of misusing are at least less than it would be on a interbanking and retail market. Uh, I think they will, and as far as I know, I'm no IT expert myself, but as far as I've understood in the MAS system, they work on a proof of stake 
system with the connected banks. Uh, so that means there is nearly no electrical uh, electric uh, consumption. That is more than it would be if they work on, let's say, common access or extra data bases. In that case, I would say this in Germany because uh, in the summer we had a uh, seminar of central bankers in Diligen, and one professor from Israel was arguing that a uh, very well known professor, uh, Kukirman or Tukirman, he, on big and monetary policy issues, he was arguing that actually forget about distributed ledger. Central banks in due time are going to take over through centralized ledger. And centralized ledger takes these electricity costs out, but in that case, if you are running a centralized ledger, it's not very difficult from current uh, fiat currency that you have, uh, which is virtually in your bank in any case. So in that case, kind of the edges are becoming very marky. And you don't understand whether if it's centralized ledger, is it still so-called virtual currency or because it takes the distributed ledger away. Yeah. And it takes the common sense away because you have Big Brother uh, telling your, your accounts. And if there's something wrong, probably there's a compliance department where you may address to. Yeah, sure. Okay, the last question, please. Do you think that, uh, like, I more or less know about blockchain technology and how these uh, cryptos are working, but I guess the whole question here is not how you insert Bitcoin in databases or systems of uh, central bank. The whole question is about approach how you manage money, right? So, do you think that it, now it's a matter of question like, uh, should we have global governance of money? or we should still keep it separated on each like country or economic zones and limit uh, the, uh, the circulation of money under the regulations of that specific zone. Because blockchain, electricity problem, all that thing can be solved. It's not a very hard problem. The whole question is about the approach. Now our central banks don't want to give up the full control on, uh, on the currencies. Actually, it's the approach of how you manage fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. So what do you think? Should there be a global governance or new models of how you create money, how you distribute it and how you manage it? Because it's just a question of like a philosophical question, how you want that, to keep money. That is a philosophical question, or at least it's a political question. From the point of view as a supervisor, I can tell you that we have an existing political and legal system. Uh, and in this political and legal frame and system, um, you have to approach virtual currencies. That's one thing. On the other hand, of course, you can discuss social and political systems and, of course, money systems with the issuing of money uh, from central banks in general. Uh, you can discuss that, sure. Uh, there's a lot of discussion ongoing in, in the net. Um, we, from a supervisor part, uh, uh, the point of view are not, not a part in that discussion. The only thing what I probably may say is that we, if we watch the Bitcoin transaction issue, the question is, would you like to be uh, managed with your payments by a central bank of a quite reliable government uh, within the economic value of the euro, which is since Bretton Woods, none of the fiat currencies is backed, and that's the reason why they call fiat currencies. But at least there is a kind of uh, economic value in the jurisdiction or in the eurozone behind it, which is not within the Bitcoin network, and which is controlled. And all transactions are controlled because when there is no mining, there is no verification of transactions. And so if some miners in Georgia, China, or wherever, wherever they are, do you think that mining right now is not a good idea? For whatever reason, would you be happy when your transaction is waiting to be processed? And this is the question if we're talking about the ideal behind the Bitcoin, when, when whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is, 
when we read the white paper from 2009, it, it is an ideal model of getting rid of all these financial intermediaries, um, getting rid of the money policies of central banks and all this stuff, and be happy in a happy future. The reality of Bitcoin mining is uh, that there are monopolists in more or less non-regulated areas which decide what happens in the Bitcoin network. And if you read articles that they then they are not that sure, but 85 to 95 transactions within the Bitcoin network are not transactions uh, for the change of uh, Bitcoins at all, but are just manipulations uh, for for mining transaction and for, for price manipulation. Um, I wouldn't be happy with my urgent transaction for buying a new car uh, in the hands of uh, some miners that I never had seen and uh, that I will never see in the future. So that's my personal philosophical view on existing virtual currency systems uh, that are, from my point of view, not usable uh, for the political ideals that have been behind it 10 years ago. I'm sorry for that. Well, but this is also an economic question, yeah, from uh, monetary policy. And you know, there is uh, this question has been discussed in economics. Uh, and there's the theory of optimal currency areas. So, how big should be the area of one currency? Uh, one country, many countries, the whole world. And the monetary policy has a lot of functions. And I think nobody will really, I mean, some people would like to go back to some kind of uh, gold standard, which is a sort of uh, global uh, standard. But I would say that most economists would say that um, there is one currency for the whole world will be not good. Why? Because there are lots of shocks to the economies and uh, money reaction helps to adapt to these shocks. For example, the exchange rate. If you have just one money, there is no exchange rate, right? If you have one money for the whole world, then there are no exchange rates, right? Uh, yes, but uh, we should not be so simply because uh, who says that you need to have more money? Actually, you have to have money, listen. Like, the whole you know, ideology is that you should have decentralized power. If you are, again, if you are talking about one money, you are talking about some sort of centralization. Now, what we are thinking, as a young member of the young generation, I want systems where we are defining our values and we are monetizing uh, that value. value Private can, money. Uh, like, value can be uh, can be calculated based on your health, based on your, I don't know, your uh, assets that you have, I don't know. But the question is not about one money. The question is about the system. How you want money to function like, in the economies? Do you want it to be free or you want to regulate it with fiscal policies? Uh, I got lost, I'm sorry. <laughs> you see, they again want to regulate Bitcoin with fiscal policy. No, 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 the it's question is like one currency versus many currencies, right? That's what you, you question. We do not regulate, probably there's a misunderstanding behind it. We do not regulate the Bitcoin. Uh, and when we supervise, we at least same business, same risks, same rules. That what we do on supervision uh, with uh, banks or financial services that take your fiat, uh, your drum, or in my case, my euros, um, that would be the same application if they take your bitcoins or my bitcoins. So the, the supervision point of view that doesn't distinguish it all. Of course, bitcoins are no currency, but that doesn't make a big, big difference uh, in the process of supervision. So we don't regulate the bitcoin. We don't regulate Bitcoin prices, or we prohibit um, banks to, to deal with it. If they don't want it for certain reasons, that's another issue. But we don't regulate any Bitcoin issues. And we don't regulate the private sector. That means if you want to send in Bitcoins without the, uh, without the um, intermediate the of, uh, of a banking system, you can't do that. And this is completely legal, and this doesn't require a license. The, the interesting thing is, that when the business, uh, then the, when the Bitcoin became uh, in the focus uh, of the retail market, 
Everybody wants to have a kind of financial services to get him Bitcoin or to sell his Bitcoin, which is totally stupid if you read the white paper, because they said, we do that on our own, and we don't need the financial market. And it popped up, and the people start to get used to it, because they're too lazy uh, to, to really understand uh, the Bitcoin network, so they look for somebody who sells them. Okay, can do that. But if that guy does the same, what he does, for instance, with, with money deposits, then he's the subject to supervision. And that's the function of the supervisor. The other thing about the money system behind that, and which value, and so on, this is a philosophical question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just only a supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. I would like to thank you, Dr. Gucci, and uh, yes, uh, well, and uh, for this interesting talk. Unfortunately, we didn't have as many people as I would like to, but uh, it was a very short notice. But I hope that we had a very quite interesting conversation and talked about the ideas and that little people here. We will take something to. And it'll be really interesting in, to see where I can find your paper because, as you uh, rightly said, it will be a very interesting project for our students mm -hmm. to do the same type of estimate that you did for Georgia. And actually, we can understand, for example, is there any type of impact and uh, economic importance to mining in Armenia. I can send you the paper and also in the uh, Get Georgia, Get Minus Georgia website, you have also the publication. Okay. But I will send it anyway to you. Thank you. Thank you.